thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight on one of the topics that I have presented on numerous times and is one of my favorites, and that's the academic side of the recruitment process and the things that you must do to successfully meet the standards for Division One, II, II, and Three. So thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here this evening. Thanks to Jason and the Sports Force crew and Andrew and all their team for, again, the opportunity tonight. So just a little, a little bit of background about uh, me is I've been a guidance counselor in Powell Unified, which is located in North County, San Diego, since 2005. I'm originally from the East Coast. I have a lacrosse background, so I am pretty familiar with this whole process of how do you meet the NC2A Division 1, 2, and 3 requirements. There's a lot of information that we're going to cover tonight, and I'm going to do my best to keep it short, and that way we have allowed time for the questions at the end. But as Jason said, please don't hesitate to text in a question in the text box so that way and we get everything covered and that way we can leave this evening feeling confident in next steps. So let's get going here. Hey, hey Matt, real quick. It looks like your slides might be uh, held up on the first slide. Oh. So um, I might just go ahead and bring up the presentation I know on your background slide that didn't seem to pop up. So let me let me go okay. ahead and bring that up so you can just hop into the presentation. We don't have to mess with technical difficulties too, too much. So just one second. Thank you. All right, just bringing up your slides. There you go. Looks like it finally went. Um, you want to try to go next one? There we go. It looks like it's moving okay, along. We we'll let you go right. ahead, then. Thanks, everybody. Sorry about that. Let's um, start with core courses. Core courses are very important. And that's a term you're going to hear often as you communicate with college NCAA coaches, recruiters, admissions, high school guidance counselors, teachers, and such. One way to, to simplify a core course is think of the requirements that your school district mandates for your son or daughter to earn their high school diploma. But I do say that with a disclaimer because I'm located in San Diego County. Others are with us from all across the country. So requirements are different. But if you kind of get that little trick in the back of your mind of, okay, what is my school district required for me to walk across that stage at the end of senior year, those are going to be your core courses. And what we mean by that is, as you can see up on the slide tonight, we're talking the social studies, the sciences, the Englishes, the mathematics, and so on. But they do allow, you know, of course, the world languages and the religion because those who are at um, the private schools have that as well couple of things to point out, and I put those in bold, that are key to remember. One, it has to be college prep. Okay, So we may have a student who has an IEP who is in a special education program, and let's say, for example, he takes a remedial English. That course, if it's coded as non-college prep, is not only not going to be allowed on an application for admissions, but it's also going to be blocked by the NC2A. So all the courses must be for your college prep. Another key that I always point out during this presentation is mathematics, and I put it in bold there for you. We need and must have Algebra 1 or higher. Now some of you out there, and uh, math was never my favorite personally, you may start at pre-algebra in ninth grade, and that's okay, because you're typically going to go to algebra by sophomore year geometry and second year algebra by the senior year. Well, when we count and we work on the total core courses, which I'll show you here in a few slides, it's got to be Algebra 1 or higher. 
So remember that, okay? Now, next, one of the things, oops. Jason, I think we're stuck again, I'm sorry. Not, not a problem, let, let me just, I'll there go ahead go. and bring it, there you go. <laughs> you got it. Sorry about that. Okay, so now we transition from core courses, we have what's called non-traditional courses. Non-traditional courses, and these are growing every single day throughout the year in our country. Those are going to be your online courses, independent study, your non-traditional outside of a classroom. So uh, where 7.30 to 2.30 you're in school all day, that is a, what we think of as a core course environment. Your non-traditional are these hard examples that are have here on the slide. Well, it's important to remember that these are not disallowed or they're not something you can't submit. It's just you need to be very, very careful on what you're doing. So what I advise my clients and my students that I work with during the day is that there needs to be constant communication and there has to be a plan set so that way that if and when a student takes one of these non-traditional courses, it matches your school district and the NC2A requirements. Why? Well, one, you're going to use it later on for potentially college grad or excuse me, high school graduation, college admissions, and NC2A eligibility requirement. Also, Another way to look at this is let's say early on in high school we have a student who gets a low grade, a D or an F, and they want to improve that grade for college admissions, overall GPA, for their strength and give them opportunity to not only get confidence back in that subject, but also so it's accepted at the next post-secondary level. There may be a summer opportunity that falls in one of these categories. If that's so the case, that's great, just make sure it's accredited and matches what the NC2AA requires. Otherwise, we're in a situation where we've wasted time, potentially money, and it's a really hard conversation when that happens for a kid because they, you know, they're disappointed and it can be prevented by making sure the communication is there. Okay, so that transitions us now to what's called initial eligibility. Okay, all the jargon the NC2A uses, but one of the first things they use is what's the initial eligibility of the student athlete? And that's listed there below. And I'm going to give you screenshots of the SAT sliding scale here, the minimum course, core course GPA. But this is the basics. So of course you're a graduate from your high school, you've met the core courses based on a D1 or 2 level, you've hit the GPA, and you've hit the SAT. So let's look at what that means. The early academic certification, I have D1 on the left and D2 on the right. So again, I don't want to read this to you because you can see in the text that you have the minimum scores for the SAT and the ACT, minimum GPA 3.0, courses listed underneath, D2 on the right, minimum scores for SAT and ACT, GPA of again 3.0. Key to point out D1 is 14 core courses and D2 is 12 core courses. So why is this a good thing? If, if you're a student and you're looking at these numbers and the breakdown of these scores and you're thinking, well, I've met that and exceeded it, that's a very positive thing. You would be called and considered an early academic qualifier. That means that things are looking great. Keep up the hard work. You only have a few more things left to do to be successful to meet the final requirements. Some of you may be thinking right now, well, where's D3, Matt? What about Division 3? I'm going to talk more about that at the end. We're going to go D1 to D2 to D3, but know that Division 3 has its own separate, unique expectation standards and rules in order to be eligible to participate. So there's our early academic certification. Okay, so D1, core courses that are required right now. 
And I say now because many of you may have read in the news that this is changing for class of 2016, and we'll show you that here in a little bit. But here are your 16 core. And so if you go back to what I said earlier, if you think, okay, what does my high school require for me in order to earn my diploma and graduate on time? Typically, but I say that with a disclaimer, you can't bank on it, it will be these requirements. English is a, is a given. The majority of high schools in our nation require four years of English, and the majority of four-year colleges and universities require four years of English. Mathematics, again, a point I'm going to hammer home tonight is that Algebra 1, we need to go Algebra 1 or higher. If you're a little bit underneath that, okay, no cause for panic. It's just what is the plan, okay? Then we have our sciences, and then what they do for those of you who are brand new to this is they ask that you use the additional year for one of the above areas of the English, the mathematics, and the sciences. Social science, this is an example of depending on what your high school requires. Per, per, perfect example is where I work. We have a three-year social studies requirement. Other districts may have something different. The NC2A asks for the two years. And then we have four years from the other categories. So how do we arrive at this? Well, let's say, for example, you're a kid who's ex excellent in science and you do three years or four years. Well, those two additional years drop right into that four-year additional. World language. You've got to have two years of world language for college admissions. Some of you may be doing three. Some of you may be excellent at world language. You're doing four. Wonderful. All of that credit, all of that coursework is not lost. It's a very positive thing. Okay, sliding scale, D1. So think of just as it says, a sliding scale or a teeter-totter. The better the GPA, the lower the SAT or ACT score is. The lower the GPA, the better you must do on the SAT or the ACT. And this is changing, and I have a screenshot of that here in a little bit, but just kind of gives you an idea, and, and many, if not all of you, are familiar with this. You know, the harder you work in class, you can make it a, a point of the easier things will be later on, and this is an example of that. Okay, so here are the new requirements, and they're not earth-shattering, but there are two that are very important, it's, and what I believe is number one and number three on this slide. The GPA is moving from a 2.0 to a 2.3. And number three, I think this is the biggest one. Ten of the core courses must be done and completed before the start of the senior year. Now here's what's really nice. The NC2A allows summer going into senior year to count towards that ten, which is great. Why is it great? Well, we could think back earlier to the presentation where I said, let's say we have a student who earned a D in freshman English, and he says, you know what, I need to fix this for many reasons. I'm going to do that summer of going into my senior year. Okay, great, as long as we then match the, the correct course, it's accredited, it's on the NC2A list at your local high school, wonderful, done, problem solved, that course can go into the 10 because they allow that, those summer months to count, which is really nice in terms of what I am expecting and flexibility we may need for maybe a struggling student or a student who needs to clean up a couple errors that they made in the past. Of course, everything begins August 1, 2016. So for those of you who are in the cl that class or, or younger, these are the new requirements that will apply to your academic eligibility. Okay, they also came up, the NC2A, with three new terms. We have a qualifier, an academic red shirt, and a non-qualifier. A qualifier is someone who has met everything. All the ducks are in a row, core courses are met, NC, or excuse me, SAT, ACT minimum requirements are met, everything is ready to roll. They're a graduate of the high school, you name it. 
why is that a wonderful thing? And that's what ideally we want for every single one of you who's attending this webinar and every student athlete in the country who's aspiring to play D1 or D2. It means that you can play right away. So if you're a football player, you're playing right away in the fall. If you're a soccer player, fall. You know, it means you're eligible to be on the field. You can receive money. You can practice right away. Everything is wonderful. The new piece to this is the academic red shirt. And many of you may be familiar with the red shirt term when it comes to a, a, a college athlete who's injured. They'll say she's using her red shirt year. She was injured. She's a tennis player. She's coming back next year for an extra year of eligibility. They're using this now for the academic piece. And it's really kind of cool if you think about it. What they're doing is they're allowing student athletes who may need to fix something to still be recruited, to still be accepted into the college and be on campus. They can receive money, which is incredible, I think, and they can even practice, but there is a timeline on there, and I put it up there, depending on the school, you know, semester quarters, that everything needs to be cleaned up by that time. So that first quarter, that first semester ends, whatever error or mistake or last task of the checkbox needs to be completed by then, so that way the student athlete can then play for their, their respective college or university. And then the last one is a non-qualifier. So something has happened where the student didn't graduate, core courses weren't met, SAT or ACT wasn't high enough, something took place where they're not meeting one or multiple of the requirements. And that student, of course, cannot participate, can't receive any you know, um, scholarship or, or money that the coach or the program was able to offer. Okay, so here's a full qualifier under the new category, and I know this looks like a lot of information, so take a minute, 16 core courses, I broke it down by subject level, I put in bold, remember that key, one of the things I want everyone to take away tonight is make sure, you know, 10 of those core courses before the seventh semester of high school, so remember you do have the summer to use that as an extra, call it two and a half months. And then, you know, the GPA is going up. Remember that it's the 2.3 in those core courses where it has been a 2.0 for some time. So I'll just leave that up for a second so that way you can scan over the 16 core. And this is, again, D1 whole qualifier. This is the goal that everyone here sh should have tonight. And uh, certainly everyone else in the country is aspiring to play. Division one. Okay, here is a comparison of the the old and the new NC, or excuse me, well NCAA, SAT and ACT sliding scale scores. So you can see that again, the better the GPA the student has the easier or more wiggle room you have for the SAT and the ACT. They push the numbers up there on the right, and I put it there in red for you, so that way you can see the differences. Okay, academic red shirt. Here's, again, some information specific to if a student athlete is in this situation, what has happened. So. 16 core again, broken down by subject area, no different than the previous the two slides ago. The GPA is falling somewhere in the 2.0 or 2.299, and the SAT or ACT score has got to match the um, 16 core course of the GPA. So this is a student who has done well enough to get themselves in a situation where they just need to fix one, hopefully not more, piece to be able to play. But again, this is a kid who can be on campus, participate in practices, receive scholarship money while they're 
working hard to correct whatever it was. And this is new, okay, starting in 2016. Okay, D2. D2 changes, 16 core, broken down again by subject. Again, you've got the Algebra 1 piece. Three years of English, probably the biggest, you know, difference. The four-year additional core courses, again, many of you are in high schools where four years of English is a standard. Colleges, it's pretty much a given. So you would just pull that year there. Social science, same thing. So we're not really stretching much here in terms of the old versus the new at the Division II level. Okay, the D2, their requirements. 2.0, GPA or better in the core. And then there's your, bro your breakdown of SAT and your ACT, uh, some scores. So that's how they determine their eligibility at the Division II level. D3. Earlier I mentioned some of you may be wondering why we're not getting any D1 or where the D3 information is. D3 is unique. There are no set numbers for eligibility at the Division III level. They do it by their, their individual and spe specific campus. So whatever their admissions and their university college practices are and will be determined by that school. So what you want to do is, because many of you may be being recruited by all different levels, and I always explain to our students at the high school and the, the, the clients I help on the weekends and in the evenings is you want to keep all options open. You want to explore whatever the best opportunity for you is, where you're going to go to school, be the most happy, get a great education, play whatever your sport is, and just enjoy the four years because many of us, if not all of us, are in a sport where after we graduate, that's it. And so we're really doing this for the betterment of our future. You know, not many of us are going to be going to the NFL or Major League Baseball. Some of you may be, and I think that's wonderful, but someone with a lacrosse background, there was no pro lacrosse, or you might have a field hockey player here tonight, there's no pro field hockey. So don't rule out that division three opportunity just because maybe you've never heard of this school. That might be an opportunity to get a phenomenal education. And oftentimes I've seen with families and students is because these are the smaller private schools, they've been off they've been able to offer kids more money on the academic side than a student athlete would have gotten maybe from the athletic side, which is pretty exciting to watch. So Regardless of where or level you're being recruited for, I think one of the best pieces of advice to remember is if you strive to meet the NC2A academic requirements for D1 and 2, you're going to be fine for D3 as well. I think if the goal is and should be to earn A's and B's in a good, strong college preparatory curriculum, prep yourself for the SAT you're going to, and ACT, you're going to have opportunity at the D1, 2, and 3 level. Now, Andrew and Jason and the Sports Force crew, they're wonderful in terms of the recruiting aspect of the, you know, ability of an athlete. You know, this presentation tonight is solely focused on the school aspect. So, you know, a lot of opportunity to use their support on the academic, or excuse me, athletic side as well in terms of the actual recruitment of the kid. But in terms of academics, if you kind of come up with the idea of, okay, I'm going to meet the requirements for D1 and D2, then D3 would fall right in line with that as long as grades are strong and we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. So with that said, I know that there are you know questions out there. Again, I know it was a lot of information. There's a lot more information that you know, Jason, Andrew, and I can support with tonight after this meeting with families individually and you know we're here to help so I'd love to hear questions tonight about anything related to requirements, courses, SAT, ACT, maybe specific sport questions. Jason and I can maybe team that one depending on that question. So 
Let's have at it. My favorite part of the night, the question and answer. All right, Matt. Thank, thanks so much. We have some good questions already coming in. Um, Bill's asking if you can go into a little bit more on the academic red shirt. Uh, just break it down in a little more detail versus uh, the athletics and the benefits of the academics. I know you touched on it real quick, but just a little more breakdown of that. Okay. Sure. You got it. So the academic red shirt will take effect in 2016 with all the new requirements. And I, in my eyes as a counselor, it's, I see it as a positive. Okay, so I don't want anyone to think, well, is this something bad if my son or daughter is an academic redshirt? The way it's explained to me when I go to the training every fall for the counselors, and they, st they started with it this year because it was such a popular topic, is that they're trying to help, help the student athlete get to where they need to be academically so then that way they can become a full qualifier which means they can practice play in games re receive the money and everything is set in a positive way from the get-go so how does a student arrive at an academic red shirt they arrive at an academic red shirt because something wasn't completed or grades weren't Completed meaning core courses could be low. We might have not enough of the count, so not enough of the core courses that are due before the senior year. We could have um, maybe a low mark, an F grade in one of those core courses, and we never fixed it, and that skewed the count. That's a you know a segue of that example. The SAT or the ACT score may not be high enough and fall in the window of the sliding scale. Those are going to be your two primary reasons. I think one thing that I can point out, and many of you may not know this, the NC2A does accept the grade of a D. And a lot of people are surprised when they hear that. And it gets, they, they do allow a D. So if I, again, I keep using that English example. So I'm a freshman in high school. I get a D in freshman English. The NC2A will take that grade. However, however, a four-year college would not. So that's why there's always ha there always needs to be a meeting where we sit down and we plan out, okay, here's what I did wrong, now I need to go fix it because they're not going to accept it when you submit your application in fall and senior year. So I hope I gave a good amount on the academic redshirt and a little bit more. You know, if there's more on academic redshirt, please let us know. And there's going to be more coming as we get closer to 2016, but I I give you my word it's a positive for, for a kid. Perfect. And that leads into this next question nicely. Uh, Ashley was asking about that 2016 deadline. Is that all into effect right now if you're graduating in 2017? Or is that something that's going to be retro for just people that enter high school in 2016 was her question. It's, it's for the class of 2016. Or excuse me. It starts on August 1, 2016. So that means if I'm a... So we're at 15. So if I'm sophomore and below, that means that I need to meet these minimum requirements. Or if I'm an eighth grader when I arrive in high school next in the fall, those you know I will have those requirements. So again, no reason for panic because if you're earning you know solid marks, you're in college preparatory curriculum you're prepping for SAT, ACT, you're going to be okay. Now, if maybe you had a D or an F along the way, or maybe you had a repeat of class, or something took place where you maybe didn't do as well on SAT, SAT or ACT, that's okay um, because there, you, there's still time and you can fix that. You know, it, it, it's an opportunity using maybe summer coursework, depending on what your school district offers. It can absolutely be done. Perfect. Um, Tom's asking another question about the red shirt. As you said, there would be a good amount of questions there. And he's asking, he says he understands the GPA fluctuality, but um, what it looks like, let me read this. It looks like he's asking, how can you make up a class before that semester or quarter? So I'm thinking he's asking how you make up the class if that's how your red shirting looks like. Well, what happens is, the academic redshirt 
is actually the, the student athletes already on campus. You're already there. So what will happen is the school will communicate with the student, with the high school guidance counselor, the parent, the coach would obviously be part of these conversations. And the student is fixing that, whatever the course potentially on their site. Because remember, they're allowed to practice. They're allowed to receive money. They just cannot play in a game. Did that answer the question? Because it can be a little confusing at times. Yeah, Tom, let's, let's know if that answered it. Um, nothing on his end right now. Because another one just, another one came in. What type of, uh, from Jasmine, what type of courses count as social science classes? Again, I'll be very broad here because it's going to differ by high school, school districts. So, for example, you could have something such as, I've seen geography, freshman year certainly a world history, U.S. history, and then government is often usually somewhere in there, typically senior year. Now keep in mind, you know, you might have a kid who's taken APs. Well, of course, those meet as well. So if I take AP world history, then AP U.S. history, and then AP government, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade in that order, those are certainly courses that would fall under the social science category. Again, differs by school district. My school district has a three-year requirement. I've worked with kids who have a two-year requirement. I've worked with kids who have taken some things freshman year, such as a geography or a world civilization. It all depends. Uh, another question coming in is related to social studies again is would law count? Again, without, you know, Knowing the background of the school district and the particular high school, it will depend on a few things. Certainly, is the class college preparatory? Hopefully it is. The majority of high school classes on every campus are college preparatory. The next question or next piece of the answer would be, is that course recognized by the NCT or is it on your high school list to be recognized by the NC2A? eligibility center. So, you know, Jasmine, that may be one where we talk one-on-one -on -one or as a group with Jason after we're done tonight just so we can confirm that. I don't want you to think we're, we're leaving you out there with just that question, but again, without knowing, you know, the, you know, more specifics about where you are, your district, I don't want to give um, too much of an answer and that way you're, you know, it's incorrect. Okay. So another question, homeschool, oh, this is good. How does homeschool work? That's, that is a great question, and we see this every now and then. Well, typically homeschool students are still viewed upon as students within their homeschool district. So for example, I'm in Poway Unified, which is in North County, San Diego, for those of you who are coming in from the East Coast or other parts of the country. So the kids in our area, who are in home school, who are still within our boundary, are considered Poway Unified kids, and then they're to their specific high school. And I work at Ranch Bernardo High School, so if I'm a home school kid, I'm still considered Ranch Bernardo High School. So the curriculum and requirements would still match. So even if I'm home schooled, I still need to meet those criteria that was discussed earlier. So four years of English you know, three years of mathematics, two years of social science, and so on. So that way, they know, they be an NC2A, that you're meeting with, or not only meeting with, you're meeting the requirements to not only graduate, but also be NC2A eligible and ready to play at Division One, Two, or Three. Again, Victoria, that could be a question where maybe we discuss later on one-on-one -on -one, so that way I can do some research and you know Jason and Andrew can do their part on the athletic side as well but that's that's a good one and uh, you know happy to help on that one because that's certainly absolutely 100% possible and doable for a homeschool kid to play NC Division 1, 2, or 3. Great stuff, great stuff. What Thanks else? Matt. We have We have another one that came in from Jessica. She's asking as far as the D3s go how do you find out what each school's requirements are? Great question. 
So multiple ways. One is as you're being recruited, you can directly ask that coach. Okay, so let's say you know you're at a, a, a showcase camp or a, a summer tournament or a, you've gone to actual school for their tur or their summer camp. You're going to be interacting with those coaches. That's one way. Another way is you know simply getting online and reading about what they require. And as you formulate your list, depending on what you know grade you're in, because we may, you know we have ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth graders with us tonight. Depending on you know your goals and your list, you can research you know those specific. Let's say three to five schools is is a way. And then certainly, you know this is what Jason, Andrew, and I help students with. You know we we team together to help families navigate this process. So that's something I've done for many many family. And Jason and Andrew have as well with their their support. So, you know that's absolutely something that we could find out for you and help you navigate D three. You know I love all opportunity for any kids. I just I've I've been so impressed with the D three over the years, just because I've seen a lot of kids not only get a fantastic education but also get a chunk of money because they've worked so hard at academically. They've you know they've said you know, here's this merit money, please come to our school. And a lot of kids love it because they, you know, can play quicker and, and it's it's awesome. You know, not to, it's no knock on D1 or D2, it's just what's best for you, what do you want, what's best for your kid, you know, because that's, that's what it's all about, is, you know, being happy and getting a great education. Okay, so looks like we have an SA, no, excuse me, an ACT question. Uh, let's see. The, uh, I was under the impression the highest possible score was a 36 for the SAT. Now, are we talking for NC2A eligibility? Are we talking college admissions? Because there's, there's different ways we can answer this question. The the NC2A has their standard for the SAT and the ACT. That's just for eligibility. So I take the SAT, I take the ACT, I hit their minimum requirement, I've checked that box. I now transition to admissions in a sense because remember NC2A is not admissions, the coach is not admissions. I still have to go in front of that review board. So I submit my application in the fall of senior year and then that's reviewed by that group. And then that particular school, college university, will have their standard for SAT and ACT. So there's kind of different ways to answer that one in terms of the, not environment, but the, the standard set by NCAA and then a standard set by the college and university. All right, great. We have a really good question here from Kelly, and I've seen this from a couple families, so this, this hits home. It goes into the transfer ability, and it just is asking, what are your thoughts about a student who wants to attend a D1 or a D2 school but may struggle academically? Uh, how about starting out at a junior college and then transferring to a D1 or D2? Is that a possibility, and what do you recommend? Wow, <laughs> great question. And First response is absolutely is that an option for a kid and it can be a great one for multiple reasons and I think the first one I always start with with families it can be not only be opportunity but it's more important it can be cost you know with our economy in 08 09 going upside down we saw the enrollment at community college increase quite a bit okay and that's not because you know, kids couldn't get into four year anymore. It's because they were great kids who had all this opportunity on a transcript and all this hard work, but they financially couldn't do it. So they said, I'm going to start a community college. It's also for a kid who maybe needs to clean up a few things, wants to start in a smaller environment, get some initial coursework done, 
and then transfer in. I actually write a blog on my website, and I wrote about this the other day. About the, for those of you in California, the UC system has what's called the Transfer Admission Guarantee Program. It's called the TAG program. I wrote about that just the other day, and that's a great thing. So, for example, if you're a kid who's getting recruited and you think, well, I know I want to play, but my grades aren't good enough yet, then go to community college and do well in school, play the sport, continue to grow at the sport, you're going to get looks because you're already getting looks now. The other thing to remember is if you are not able to get into the school that like maybe is your dream school, and even though you're a great athlete and the coach says, I, I, I love you, I want you, but I can't get you in, it's, it's your, your grades just aren't good enough, okay, that doesn't mean the book is closed. It doesn't mean this, the game is over. You know, It means that there's another way you can attack this. I think a perfect example of this is Aaron Rodgers of the Green Bay Packers is an example that probably everyone knows. He got looks, and he said, you know what, I would still want to try for something better because I think I'm that caliber of a player. He started at a community college, did great. Cal Berkeley picked him up, did great, and now we know what's happening with the rest of his future. So it's not a bad place. And I always say community college because, you know, community college is college. So I always try to ingrain that into my students. It's like, don't, you know, don't, don't say junior college, it's college. You know, it's community college. All the coursework you're doing there is going to match for you to transfer somewhere at the four-year level. And at the end of the four years, your degree will say fill in the blank from that university. It's not going to be a two-year degree and then a two-year degree. So I'm a huge proponent of the community college. Awesome. Great, great job there, Matt. Another good question here from Evan goes back to the – uh, red shirting qualifier and non-qualifier and he's just asking if you're able to go to a school and start out as a non-qualifier and then become a qualifier as you go on at school is that an option it's it's very very limited I don't think I've ever seen it because for someone to be classified as a full-on non-qualifier I, I want to say we didn't do our job. We being the parents, the kid, the all of us that are in this for the betterment of the student, meaning that we didn't catch something or multiple things early on for it to be, you know, the course count of the core courses being that off, the SAT or the ACT being that low. We didn't start prepping early enough. The plan wasn't put into place to prevent that because if you're a non-qualifier, Look at those numbers, and I always say look at those numbers because I'm not trying to be harsh or, you know, say it's not possible, but if you're not qualifying at those GPA and SATs, the four-year college, remember, you still have to cross the bridge of admissions. So we have to look at the numbers and say, okay, what's realistic here? Honestly, in that situation, the best way to go is to the previous question where I'd say to a kid, look, you're a good kid, you have, you have goals here, you've got some talent on the field, let's look at a community college. That's because, again, to go from non-qualifier to full qualifier is, again, just being broad here could be pretty challenging. Thanks, Matt. I think that's probably what Evan was just looking for, how those options play out. Um, right, and that's why academic redshirt is a positive thing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, Evan, let us know, you know, what your situation is potentially, if that's something that's going to affect you, or if you're a 2015, 2016 grad, we can maybe help you out and look at your options as well. Absolutely. All right, looks like we have a follow-up from Kelly on the JUCO question, just asking how starting off at a JC will affect eligibility years at a D1 or a D2. That is a great question. And I might actually defer that one to Jason and Andrew because, again, it, my, my, my experience has been the, it will depend on, it could potentially depend on the sport. Um, but we'll get back to you on that one because I have not had that situation because the majority of my kids have actually been able to successfully get to the post-secondary option directly from high school to four-year. 
So I would respectfully ask that we research that one for you and we'll get back to you because I have not had that situation before. But I'm making notes right now. And Kelly, we'll, we'll go ahead and email you on that and follow up and I'll make sure we get a recruiting more of an expert on that as well to help you out with that. All right, looks like we've Definitely. come through a good part of the questions, okay. Matt. Great. If we have any more, maybe one or two last minute ones I want to get in. Otherwise, just want to thank you again. Looks Appreciate like. your time and just all this great information that you're providing on the NCAA eligibility requirements. And it was just, again, lots of great information. We really appreciate you helping us out. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and thank you. And again, appreciate your patience with our little technical list there with the first slide. And, you know, let Andrew, Jason, and I know how we can help. We're here to help. We've got a lot of support. This is something we love doing. This is a topic and, and environment we love to work on and work in. So thank you again. It's, it's been a lot of fun. And I just want to remind everyone, as soon as this webinar ends, there's going to be a quick survey afterwards that will let us know how tonight's workshop was, what you learned, any additional questions you have, and a way to set up a consultation with Matt to go over your specific and personal situations one-on-one. -on -one. So please look out for that. We also will follow up with an email that will get you the slides and video from tonight. And again, we'll provide you an opportunity to touch base one-on-one -on -one with Matt as well. Also, just want to thank you again for coming out. We know you guys have a lot of options out there, so hopefully you got a lot from tonight. If you have any additional questions, feel free to email either Matt or myself or Andrew at workshops at sportsforceonline.com. Again, that's workshops at sportsforceonline.com. Thanks, everyone, and we will talk soon.